we are joined by geologists and nemesis of the climate change agenda, also known as Chris Bowen's greatest fear, Professor Ian Plymer. Ian, welcome to Spectator TV. Thank you for having me. Ian, climate change nonsense has been kicking around for quite a few years, and in that time we have seen some truly bizarre and alarming geoengineering projects. You know, someone wanted to put giant mirrors in space to stop light from reaching the Earth. Others wanted to remove clouds from the upper atmosphere. There was one plan to churn up the sea floor and create sea foam to reflect light, you know, to hell with the marine life cycle. And another one wanted to spray salt water into our clouds, and on and on it goes. But I think you found the craziest project of them all, and that's carbon capture. What do they want to do to our great artesian basin? And tell our viewers what this special geological feature means for us. Well, the Great Artesian Basin is one of the greatest aquifers in the world. It is certainly the greatest freshwater aquifer in the world. So that's absolutely precious. We use that water for towns, for stock and for irrigation. And there's a particular unit in the Great Artesian Basin called the Precipice Sandstone. And in that sandstone, which is very porous, the pores are filled with water, or very, very rarely gas and oil. So the proposal is to take the carbon dioxide from a coal-fired power station, use about 20% of the energy that's developed from that coal-fired power station, liquefy the carbon dioxide that comes up the smokestack, and that requires very high pressures and low temperature, then transport that over 200 kilometres to a well in the Great Artesian Basin, and then pump that down into the well. Now, that artesian water is held at very high pressure. So what you've got to do is to pump it against the pressure and, and push out the artesian water and fill the pores with liquid carbon dioxide. Now, that sounds energy inefficient, which it is. It sounds crazy, which it is. But no one seems to have gone back in time and looked at what happens when carbon dioxide under pressure at depth decides it wants to come to the surface. Now, in the Great Artesian Basin, we know that that artesian water comes to the surface. It comes in uh, mound springs in the western part of the basin. We see more than 5,000 of these mound springs. This is where the precipice sandstone leaks. That water, we know, is about 2 million years old. In the eastern part of the Great Artesian Basin, which covers most of Queensland and almost a quarter of Australia, in the eastern part, the water is very young and the precipice sandstone is exposed. So any liquid, any gas can actually come out to the surface. But we have a case in Cameroon, uh, which really hit the headlines in 1986. There was one that didn't hit the headlines in 1984. But in 1986, there was a crater lake and the bottom waters were saturated with carbon dioxide. That was carbon dioxide bubbling out from deeper down and the cold water could dissolve a lot. And if you disturb that cold water, and we don't quite know how it was disturbed, but if you disturb that cold water, it releases carbon dioxide. And on one very still night on the 21st of August, 1986, that's exactly what happened. We released carbon dioxide from Lake Neos in Cameroon. It rose to the surface and because it was a still night and it's a gas that's heavier than air, it pushed aside all the air and almost 2,000 villages were asphyxiated. 3,500 stock were killed and countless wildlife were killed and that was due to a burp of carbon dioxide from deep down that actually came to the surface. Now, we're creating exactly that situation in the Great Artesian Basin, holding a huge tonnage of liquid carbon dioxide in the pores of the sandstone. But what they don't tell us is that when you change liquid carbon dioxide into carbon dioxide gas, there is an expansion of about 300 times. Now, that's called an explosion. And we geologists spend our life looking for these gas explosions because associated with them, you get gold and you get copper and gold. So we've looked at these things for decades. We've looked at little um, trapped bubbles of gas in rocks to try to work out what's happened with the carbon dioxide. And the physics of carbon dioxide is very well known. So this wonderful harebrained scheme is to fill the pores of the precipice sandstone and just sit back and wait 
for another late NEOS type carbon dioxide <laughs> explosion and kill people. Well, there's 180,000 people that live and uh, work on the Great Artesian Basin. Most of these live in river towns. They are lower down. That's where the carbon dioxide is going to accumulate. Now, that is probably the most harebrained scheme of the whole lot, to actually put people's lives at risk to try to get rid of a gas, which is actually plant food. The best thing to do would be to release this gas to the air and let the plants use it. So rather than hugging plants, they want to destroy people and destroy wildlife and destroy stock. This is just nuts. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with the Labor government that brought us <laughs> things like pink bats, you know? It's not that they have a great track record of interfering with things, but, Professor, the way you described it quite colourfully in your article, I'm envisioning some great eruption, the Vesuvius of Queensland, another Krakatoa. You know, are we talking about uh, an explosion that's going to be like that or will it be a little bit less, you know, oh, photogenic? Yes, yes. Um, a lot of people think volcanoes erupt lava. A lot of them don't. A lot of them just erupt gas. Um, normally, it's a mixture of water vapour and carbon dioxide. Uh, in the case of Lake Neos, it was pretty well all carbon dioxide. So um, these gas eruptions are very, very common, and they are enormous. So if we want to put 300,000 tonnes, which is a proposed figure, of liquid carbon dioxide into the Great Artesian Basin, that is going to expand 300 times its volume. It will fracture and break rocks. We know that from looking at these old eruption sites around the world. Rocks get blasted up. Rocks also roll and come down. We throw stuff out a huge uh, distance. We don't end up with a typical conical volcanic crater. We end up with a dirty big hole in the ground. And we end up with the whole countryside covered in a gas that's not poisonous, it's colourless, it's odourless, but once it pushes aside air, you have nothing to breathe. So you can't live on carbon dioxide. The plants love it, but you don't. You die. So this is the harebrained scheme. Now, we have a, a Senate inquiry that is being chaired by Senator Hanson Young, and this inquiry was pushed very, very hard by One Nation. That inquiry has taken submissions. I have made a submission to them, as, as have many others. And that Senate inquiry um, will sit fairly soon once they've read all the submissions, and I think they do that by the end of May. And I think the Queensland government has an opportunity at the end of May to say, no, this is madness. Now, they may or may not do this because there are elections coming up, both state and federally, and Queensland seats are absolutely vital for the federal government and for the Queensland state government. Uh, they need every seat they can get because they look as if they're going to go out of power. So we may well have uh, a reversal of this view, not based on the engineering and not based on the science, but based on counting the heads that are going to vote you out of government. Well, Ian, it's almost as if people were so disappointed by Australia's lack of volcanic activity, because what we've got is you know, barely passing the threshold, they decide to go and create their own volcano, no doubt as some kind of tourist attraction <laughs> or something. Can you imagine the insurance risk on creating a volcano underground? I mean, give me a break. But there's also a risk... Well, it would be magnificent, yes. <laughs> ..for about three seconds. But there's also a risk that the water itself could be poisoned, and one opponent called the project unthinkable, while even the Queensland Premier Stephen Miles said that it doesn't sound like a good idea. Now, if something were to go wrong with the water, say it was poisoned or, or they lowered the level of the water or something went wrong, is that going to have a catastrophic effect on the environment and the people who rely on the artesian? Like, how bad could the implication be if this goes wrong? We've been using water from the Great Artesian Basin since 1878. There are more than 10,000 bores into the Great Artesian Basin. We have overexploited the water and the level has gone down about 100 metres. Uh, in some bores where it was artesian and the water rose under its own pressure to the surface, it's now sub-artesian and it has to be pumped some of the distance to the surface. So we've already had a big effect on the artesian basin. The water in the artesian basin is very slightly alkaline and if we put a lot of um, carbon dioxide into that water, we create carbonic acid. We then dissolve um, certain elements from clays and from carbonate minerals. And these are things like arsenic and lead and cadmium. So we increase the amount of 
poisons in great artesian basin water just by simply making it slightly more acid. Now, the great artesian basin water also has methane in it that bubbles out at times from some of the bore fields, and sometimes you can light this and the, they burn. And it also has rotten egg gas in some of the the, um, the bore areas where they use the water for thermal baths, such as at Moree or um, Lightning Ridge in New South Wales. Sometimes that water has an awful pong to it of rotten egg gas. So we can actually change the chemistry of the Great Artesian Basin. And uh, that is a bit of a concern if we use arsenic or lead-rich waters for irrigation. Yes, well, I mean, if you want to, every farmer will be aware of this. If you want to put up a shed or dig a dam or do pretty much anything on a property, you have to wade through years of work to get the development applications through, all these environmental studies. I mean, it is a monstrous, you know, over-regulated industry. But the, are you writing a piece, there doesn't seem to be much interest in assessing the risk of what could be a complete catastrophe for a large percentage of Australia. We've only got a minute or so here left, but just quickly, Ian, do you know, like, would you like to see more work into looking at what's going on and more studies into this? And do you think there will be more studies? Well, if it's a wind turbine, <laughs> solar panels or pumping liquefied carbon dioxide into the country's major aquifer, it doesn't matter because we're saving the planet. And if we destroy the planet to save it, we've done it for the common good. And that's what you're up against. Oh, that's so true and so well said. Thank you for joining us here today on Spectator TV. Thank you for having me.